We're now in an age where one single technology can affect billions of people all at one time. They actually, as a result, cause upheavals and disruptions in a whole wide range of industries and areas. Entertainment, transportation, healthcare. A lot of these technologies we can no longer study in a lab. They sort of have to be put out there for people to be exposed to them and for people to use them. And how do we understand that at scale and guide these technologies to more positive outcomes? We need data scientists to help us understand that. So we are one of the top universities in the world. We're one of the top two public universities in the United States. This is the full Block M. You're getting the full deal here. And uh, the only difference is you, you won't necessarily be able to go to all seven home football games. Graduates of this degree are fully vested members of our alumni community. Uh, removing the constraint of having to travel in, and live in Ann Arbor it's just not practical for a vast uh, population of potential students. But still being able to benefit from that, that world-class expertise is a, it's an incredible thing. I think that what's exciting about data science right now is that it can be used across sectors. So whether you are interested in healthcare or education or work with Silicon Valley companies, all of those areas can be informed by data. And that's part of why when we're dealing with high stakes areas like healthcare and education, that ethical use of data becomes so important. And our care to make sure that we aren't biased is important. Hello, Chuck here. Uh, we're in Milan, Italy. Hello, Chuck here. We are here in uh, Paris, France. Well, hello. We are at Bletchley Park. Here we are in Orlando. Here we are in... Uh, so my name is uh, Charles Severance. I am a clinical professor at the University of Michigan School of Information. I am now, by far, the most dominant Python class in the whole world, touching over two million lives. And you might say, why is that? Well, I claim it's because of the assessments. If you end up doing my homework for two hours, you're doing the job you're supposed to eventually do. I mean, my homework is job-ready skills, right? I mean, I don't have homework that is a waste of time just so I can make it hard for you. So I hope that when you participate in this new master's online degree that you are as excited as I am. I'm excited to be part of it. I'm excited to see something that I consider completely next generation in terms of approach to teaching. So I really hope that someday we meet and someday you can tell me what you think of this particular experience and to see if, if you saw it as wonderful as I believe that it's going to be. Go Blue. The math program uh, provides the rigorous and innovative uh, curriculum to all the students who are interested in becoming an applied data scientist. You will leave here with the portfolio that proves that uh, you can do end-to-end uh, -end applied data science uh, and you can apply these techniques you have learned to real-world problems. And we're super excited uh, to meet with you, to work with you, and to collaborate with you. Go Blue! Welcome to the University of Michigan School of Information. My name is Amy Humkis Hayes, Assistant Director of Academic Program Development and member of the MADS team. We're very excited to have you here today as we spend the next hour or so together talking about the Master of Applied Data Science degree program. As we get started, I'm going to go ahead and let our two esteemed panelists introduce themselves. Hello. My name is Chao Mei. I'm a professor at the School of Information. Uh, I'm the faculty director of the MADS program. So uh, you can see that uh, I'm working with uh, Amy, I'm working with Chuck, I'm working with uh, uh, faculty instructors and uh, staff to make this uh, program the best data science program in the world. Yeah, you've been working for like two and a half years, yes. all of you. And I, I'm uh, Charles Severance. I'm a clinical faculty member at the uh, School of Information. I teach a lot of on, uh, Python classes, uh, web design classes, and in the MADS program, 
I'm teaching two classes, uh, SI 511 uh, databases and SI 611 uh, database architectures. And uh, I'm really pleased with the amount of work. I just teach two classes and you two have been working on this for a, a very long time. Thank you. Thank you. So as I indicated, we're gonna be spending about the next hour together answering your live questions and talking in more depth about the Master of Applied Data Science degree program or what we lovingly refer to as MADS. So I have my phone here with me and rest assured, all I'm using it for is to collect your questions and give them to our two panelists who are joining me today. So please feel free to ask anything that might come to mind about the maths curriculum, the structure of the program, how our faculty broach online learning and teaching, and what the Master of Applied Data Science program is all about. We're also happy to answer specific questions uh, that are relevant to the entire group that's joining us on issues like admissions, for example, or what happens when you become a student at the University of Michigan School of Information. So to go ahead and get started, I was hoping that both of you could tell us a little bit more about what excites you about the maths degree. Oh, absolutely. So um, uh, as you know that I took this uh, job two and a half years ago, right? Uh, so we were so excited about uh, building this new program. Uh, with, uh, in, in our minds, it's not just yet another program in Michigan. It is the innovative program that we take this as the chance to really build uh, you know the next generation of professional uh, degree professional education we think this is the perfect opportunity to innovate right to uh, create something that have ever have never existed before so uh, we are very excited about the the curriculum which we will definitely talk about later right so this curriculum is actually a good balance between uh, rigor and flexibility and that is actually uh, customized that is uh, innovative just for students uh, in online education and that's the thing that I'm most interested and most excited about so the the thing that excites me the most is that the school of information is a school, which means it's a, a sort of a big structural entity with a dean, but we're also small compared to really large schools, which means we're the perfect place to bend the rules at the University of Michigan and evolve what the rules are. We've done this with undergraduates, we've done this with transfer student admission. I mean, we sort of go in and we meet some part of the university and we just like bend it. And then we sort of change it for good, we think. Um, uh, forever and this this MADS class idea was did that same thing meaning that we were not we did not feel constrained by the rules of the university we felt that if we felt there was something that was a good idea we would just send our dean <laughs> and a bunch of other people to the rest of the university and then fight right to fight to change this and so I see that there are things that are breakthrough in this that excite me um, that that I'm not sure that we would have even imagined five years ago that we could even ask if we could do, but now we're doing them. And so the the first thing that I like about this that makes me very excited is the one credit four week format. Um, I have been teaching for 30 years, 15 weeks, three credits, 15 weeks, and and why do we do that? Well, we do that because room allocation is really hard on campus, and you want to do that twice a year. You don't want to do that too often, and but now, of course, online, we don't have to fight about room allocation, and so it's really easy. And so what you actually find is when I'm going to teach a 15-week class, I often have four or five really good weeks. And then I got like 10 more weeks. What are you doing the 10 weeks? Well, I don't know. Let's just practice calculus for a while or do something. And so what I love about this format of the MADS program is we all can do our best four weeks or best five weeks and then move on. And then another faculty member can give you their best four weeks or best five weeks. And so to some degree, you know, you have to work in these four, these four or five weeks, but you're also kind of getting a concentrated dose of what we think is the essence of the topic that we're teaching, not stretching that out to 15 weeks just to do it, so that your time, you're learning three times as much stuff in the same 15-week period. And one credit classes, and, and so that, that to me is, is the most exciting thing here, how you can construct knowledge blocks it. So if you came and did 30 credits, you might do 10 classes, but here you do 30 classes. And so we can teach so much more. And as a faculty member, I feel like for the whole four weeks, I'm like peak. I'm really, this is, I'm, 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 I'm giving you your money's worth for four weeks and not filling. 
and then someone else can pick up. And so I think that that's really cool. And, and it has to do with the fact that we, we have a lot of faculty involved in this, and then they each get their piece, but then they give you their best piece. And, uh, and I think that's really innovative. And, you know, I've done MOOCs before, and I've done the short forms before. Uh, the other thing that I uh, was worried about that uh, I am, now that I've actually started teaching, 511 started a week and a half ago, is um, I've always been afraid that the, you, to, speak, to go at the rigor and pace that we expect of an online student, that we could not, we could not do that. I mean, uh, uh, the rigor and pace that we expect of a, on a campus student with the support and the teaching assistance and all that office hours and all that stuff, I thought we couldn't do that online. I thought it was just going to, we just, the wheels were going to come off. We were going to push too hard and the wheels were just going to fall off. And they didn't. Things like Slack. I mean, like, I'm like, holy mackerel, this is working. I mean, it, it, we, we got some rigor, we're pushing you pretty hard, and people are learning a lot, and it's working. And so those are the two, the format is what excites me the most and the amount of compressed valuable information we can squeeze in to this 30 credit program. I love hearing you say that the format is working because as you can imagine, we put a lot of thought and deliberate action into making the format work. So that's great to hear. Can you tell us a little bit more, Chuck, about the content that you're teaching and what really excites you about the content in SIADS 511 and 611? Well, so, so the content, that in particular, the thing that I like about my course is the fact that I've never been allowed to teach this material on campus. Right. I don't know exactly why that is, and I don't think that's going to last much longer because it's good material. Um, historically, we never could allocate in a curriculum three credits to teach nothing but database. And so we've always taught blah plus database, or this plus a little database, or that plus a little database, or oh yeah, here's a week of database. And, and it turns out that database is actually a, a core skill in and of its own. It's not just an add-on skill to a uh, web design class or a, a data, data mining class. It's like learning SQL. And so when the curriculum had a spot for two credits of SQL and advanced SQL, I'm like, ah. And my biggest fear at that point was that the on-campus students would find out that we had this really cool pure SQL class, which I think the on-campus students have been advocating for for a long time. Um, and so it was fun. I'm not teaching any, well, everyone knows Python, but I'm not, I'm not teaching web design or web building or anything like that. I am only teaching SQL, and I'm like, what is the best eight weeks of SQL that I can come up with? And, um, and that was really difficult for me because I'd never taught a class like that, so it took me a long time to figure out how these worked. I've been working on these classes almost all the time since May of last year yeah. mm -hmm. because we'd never taught anything like this. And so what's mm -hmm. cool now is even this semester already there is a small one and a half credit class that's borrowing some of 511 and being taught to 40 students on campus. We're hoping to expand that in the fall because now we have a lot of on-campus students that want to do data mining and they don't get enough SQL but now we're going to take the same material that, that MADS was developed for MADS because the unique focus of MADS on data science and it's totally appropriate to have two classes of SQL in that now that's going to imp imp improve our on-campus curriculum. And so I'm, I'm really excited mm -hmm. about how that it's bleeding from what I've always dreamed of teaching and was afraid of teaching at the same time because I hadn't prepared it, but dreamed of teaching that then is now going to, I think, dramatically influence our on-campus curriculum as well. That's a wonderful anecdote because it points to the power of the short time with which we've been running MADS yeah. and how mm -hmm. much it's influencing already the way that we think about the connection between our residential programs and our online program and that we look at the School of Information and all of the programs within it as one entity as opposed to kind of discrete entities that exist in silos. Xiaozhu, you also have the pleasure of yes. teaching in the MADS program. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're teaching and what makes you enjoy doing it in this mm -hmm. format? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so I have just taught uh, the uh, uh, Data Mining Group 1 class that uh, we offered uh, right in between Thanksgiving and Christmas. And then I'm developing uh, the second course of Data Mining called Data Mining 2. So I personally, I have been doing data mining research for the past 20 years. Uh, so I really enjoy the, uh, 
the freedom and the uh, you know the the privilege of uh, you know making my research, uh, making my understanding about uh, how to uh, discover knowledge from big data uh, into classroom teaching. Right, so I uh, created the residential data mining courses, uh, and then uh, you can see that uh, we have been, uh, you know, uh, making uh, another level of innovation to make them uh, two credits um, for, for maths. And the data mining class uh, starts with how to represent uh, real world data into different types of um, uh, data formats. So this is uh, uh, almost orthogonal to machine learning, uh, you know, to methods. We first talk about uh, what we know about, uh, you know, item sets data, about uh, matrix data, about vector data, about uh, sequence data then about time series data, about uh, data streams, about network data, and what kind of uh, real world information in what context should be formulated in, into each of these representations. And uh, then we uh, spend every week uh, talking about each particular data uh, representation, uh, about uh, how to effectively uh, discover knowledge, discover patterns, and computing similarities and distances uh, from data formulated in this way. Uh, and then how we can actually apply this to reality, uh, not only to characterize a big data set that you have access to, but also to use them uh, as the building blocks for downstream machine learning tasks, for instance, as features. So this is really cool, this is very fun. Um, and then uh, during the four weeks that I have taught uh, data mining one, uh, I also received lots of uh, very useful feedbacks from the students. So the math students, they have a very diverse background, they have very, very uh, unique ideas about how I'm going to apply these methods to uh, really change what I have been doing. They have lots of business insights that they gather from like uh, tens of years of practice. And they gave me lots of feedbacks too, and many of the feedbacks will be incorporated into uh, uh, the next time that all. Uh, course is uh, going to be offered. And we also received lots of uh, uh, requests, uh, right? Could you cover a little bit more uh, in this? And could you actually go deeper here, right? Uh, could you tell us that uh, whether we can just take the homework assignment, apply it to my own data, <laughs> and get XYZ from that? That really makes me uh, excited. Me too. So there's a couple of things that I'm hearing that really stand out. And so one is that we are iterating in the maths degree already and really trying to make it the best degree that we can uh, in the data science world mm -hmm. for folks that want to apply that data science knowledge immediately and in the future. And so relatedly, we're already seeing that students are taking what they're learning in their maths courses and they're applying it, for example, in their jobs. So both of you have been at the University of Michigan School of Information for way longer than I have. And so can you just tell me a little bit about what you love about this place? So what makes the school um, unique and why might somebody decide to come um, to a program that we're offering? So I would, I would say the, the thing that I love the most about the School of Information is its balance between kind of a a liberal arts approach to things and a technical slash engineering approach to things. Um, neither of those is right or wrong to the exclusion of the other. I think it's a uniquely University of Michigan thing to not be kind of like engineering dominant school or a liberal arts dominant, I mean university engineering dominant or, or liberal arts dominant university and that they're both strong, powerful, world class and they're not, neither is so big that they can dominate the other and so you can choose as a smaller school like the School of Information to find your path between sort of like the the north and south poles of liberal arts and engineering and we I think find ourselves right in the middle of that with strong connections in both directions both from a curriculum from a teaching from a faculty perspective and so I think that it is delightful to be able to think differently right so I can go and I can say uh, you know that's too technical we, that we can't teach database with that kind of math the way engineers teach database with so much math let's let's think of this a little more as a language that humans use to communicate to a really cool creature called a database system and those kinds of innovative ways of thinking about the knowledge that we're teaching uh, and using is uh, is acceptable here you can you can think outside the box you are not stuck trying to be exactly like the next school down the road that they teach it this way so we're going to teach it this way and here's the book that everybody uses and we're just going to follow that book like everybody else does we're like no that's that's not right we're we 
we, as practicing people, have, a, have feelings about what the most important things are. And, and I like the flexibility of constructing courses that I think are valuable to students, not just courses that are sort of imitation of the school down the road. Great. Shoji, what would you say? Sure. Uh, I have been in the school for uh, uh, a little bit more than 10 years, yeah. actually after you, right? Yeah, yeah. just barely. Just yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, like Chuck, that I have the training in computer science, yeah. right? And when I, uh, you know, was on the market, uh, I was fascinated about the school's uh, motto, right? That is connecting uh, information, uh, technology, and people. But not until then I joined the school, I realized that uh, how lucky then I, I have been in the school. It's really, uh, you know, always innovating and always innovating innovating in the cutting edge of different disciplines, right? So uh, in the school, you can actually find colleagues from very different uh, areas. We have people who are doing uh, computer science, we have people who are doing uh, you know, behavior economics, we have people who are doing HCI, who are doing uh, education, who are doing like social science research, of course library uh, science, and uh, they have very different training, they have very different skill set, but they have one thing in the mind, which is to use the information technology to really change the world, right? So they really want to answer the application question, the human question, right? How can we actually use what we learned to change people's uh, lives? Right, and this is happening. This is happening very fast. Uh, this is not just happening in research. This is happening in education as well. When I first joined the school, that there was the initiative of building uh, uh, the first house informatics program. Right, I was in that initiative, yeah. and that happened. So we we have a master of health informatics uh, program for like five years uh, in between uh, school information and public health. Mm -hmm. Right, and we had the first uh, you know information bachelor's, uh, bachelor's yeah. degree, and that happened. Right, and we have uh, made innovations to our uh, residential master's degree. Right, and then we have this uh, uh, maths. maths right? Well, we're also in MOOCs, right? And exactly. In between MOOCs, there, we yeah. have MOOCs. Right. So things are happening uh, very fast. Very fast. We're not actually putting the limit. We're actually putting a limit on us. Right. <laughs> well, we also never relax. It seems as soon as we're done with one thing, <laughs> we're, we've got to invent another thing. <laughs> right. As long as we believe that this is going to lead the world to actually change uh, the education, the research, uh, we're ready to do it. And this is really what I, I like the most about the school. That's great. Thank you so much, both of you. So we're going to go ahead now and start answering questions that all of you are submitting. So um, first, Zhao Zhu, can you tell us a little bit about the math that's required for incoming math students and the math that they may be exposed to mm -hmm. as part of the degree program itself? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. So, um, so because we uh, want the students to be able to finish the degree within one year if, uh, you know, uh, if uh, they take the courses full time, we do require that students have uh, the um, uh, ability of Python programming and uh, statistics uh, before coming into the program. Right? So those are uh, the prerequisites of uh, uh, our, uh, the entrance to our program. And then once you got uh, programming uh, skills and stats skills, uh, then you will find that uh, we have the end-to-end -end data science pipeline uh, waiting for you. And that always starts from how to define problems uh, uh, into the data science problem in real uh, scenarios, how to collect the data, how to use computational methods to manipulate the data, to analyze, uh, to uh, process large-scale data sets, uh, to actually do exploratory data analysis. And then how to use the state-of-the-art analytics uh, methods, data mining, uh, supervised machine learning, unsupervised machine learning, deep learning, including causal inference uh, to actually discover knowledge from the data to help you make decisions. And how to use uh, visualization techniques uh, to actually explore the data, to communicate the results uh, to your audience, right, and to help you make decisions. And not here at the end, how to actually apply the uh, knowledge that you have learned to intervene uh, your customers to actually use and build uh, field experiments and then to really change people's behaviors. And finally, how to put all of these things into the application uh, domain, right, to actually, um, you know, uh, create something that's unique uh, for this domain. One of our, one of our core values, mm -hmm. in a sense, from a prerequisite perspective is uh, prerequisites because we need them, not for prerequisites just to sort of add, act as filters. Right. right? We're a, we want everyone who is ready to take our courses to take them, and so we don't put artificial barriers of like three semesters of calculus mm -hmm. just to somehow filter down the students. Because I think, I'm not sure there's anything on this planet other than maybe physics that really deserves three semesters of calculus. 
Um, programming certainly doesn't deserve three <laughs> semesters of calculus. Mm -hmm. And so we, we have a value that when we ask for a prerequisite like Python or statistics, we're going to use it, right? We're not just mm -hmm. saying we want to make your life miserable mm -hmm. and, and that cuts down on our admissions. Our admissions process is very difficult. Thankfully, I'm not involved in it, but I know, <laughs> I know that a lot of work goes into evaluating the admissions, and Indeed I'll bet you that if we made three calculus classes a prerequisite, you'd have a lot less work to do, but that wouldn't be our value. Right? That's not our value. Our value is not to say, well, that's a lot of work. Let's just ask for three calculus classes. That's so right. I, I think that's the, the, the key thing when it comes to math that we're not asking for math, we're not expecting math just for the sake of it. That's right. Mm -hmm. if, you, if we feel you need it, we'll tell you. And, yeah. and, and Shaju's point about the biggest part of admissions is success in the curriculum, because it's just right. not helpful for anybody for you to come on this campus and then like drop out. That's, That's not good. Yes. So our admissions is really trying to ask, are you going to be successful? That's exactly mm -hmm. right. That's exactly right. So I have a couple of questions um, that are actually very, fairly easy to answer. So for example, is the program accredited? It is. Um, so as a University of Michigan degree program, it's fully accredited. And so rest assured that if there, uh, you are, for example, seeking employer reimbursement and an accredited program is part of that process, we can say confidently that we're accredited and can document that accreditation. Um, relatedly, we have someone that's asking if the online degree is similar to the traditional degree in terms of recognition. So to be clear, the transcript that we produce in the math degree, so all of the courses that are listed on your transcript, and ultimately the degree that you get along with the diploma, none of that is any different than our residential programs. So we're not, for example, including any sort of online designation in any of those places. Um, the recognition is, is actually quite similar, if not identical, to our residential programs. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about some of our other instructors or courses. So, Jojou, could you tell us a little bit about some of the other faculty at the University of Michigan School of Information that are teaching Matt's courses? Oh, sure, right. So, um, yeah, who should I start with? <laughs> there, there are so many good ones. Right. Maybe just so let's let's highlight a couple. Courses, yeah. Right? Um, mm -hmm. For instance, uh, uh, the, the fir very first course of the program, being a data scientist, uh, is taught by um, it prepared by Professor Paul Resnick, uh, who is the Associate Dean of Research uh, of the school. He's actually a renowned uh, professor and a researcher who invented uh, clever filtering, which is uh, you know the, the backbone algorithm that you, you actually use every day. What is that? Recommender systems. If you use Amazon, if you see that Amazon is recommending you know, products to you, if uh, Yelp is recommending restaurant to you, Right. If um, uh, uh, Netflix is recommending uh, movies to you, uh, and they are using the technique called recommender systems, that was first invented by Paul Resnick, right? And then we have uh, uh, Chris Brooks, uh, who have been teaching, uh, you know, uh, quite a few courses related to data manipulation, yeah. exploratory, uh, you know, data. Uh, um, uh, exploratory data analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris uh, is actually an expert in learning analytics. Mm -hmm. So he has been using uh, you know, what he observed uh, from uh, the online teaching and the data that he gathered uh, from MOOC and from other places to actually innovate uh, to uh, build the next generation of um, uh, teaching techniques. Right? And we have Yan Chen, who's actually the uh, behavior economist. Uh, so her expertise is to build uh, field experiments to answer causal questions, uh, to actually um, you know, uh, apply uh, economic theory into the reality, right? to show that uh, what mechanisms can actually help uh, uh, people make better decisions and you know, be, uh, conduct better behaviors and eventually improve, uh, deliver the social good. And she's teaching uh, export, uh, experiment design mm -hmm. and analysis. Mm -hmm. Right. And we have uh, Kevin Collins Thompson, uh, who has uh, spent uh, the first half of his career in Microsoft, uh, Microsoft Research. Um, he's an um, uh, expert in machine learning. Um, and uh, he and I actually co uh, organized the uh, CIGAR conference, that is the top academic uh, research conference annually uh, in Ann Arbor next year. Uh, he's on sabbatical. He's um, actually enjoying his time in uh, Bordeaux. Right. Mm -hmm. And when he comes back, uh, you will see that he's going to teach surprise learning and surprise learning, right? And we have lots of many other faculty, um, of course Chuck and of course Eitan Adar, who's the expert in uh, information visualization. Mm -hmm. and 
So, so one thing that I would add is that I think mm -hmm. one thing that's led to the success of MADS was I'm not sure there's any school in the world that had more MOOC experience before this started, exactly. right? I, I would say 20% of our faculty have t before MAD started have touched MOOCs one way or yeah, the other. Maybe more. Right. That, that doesn't mean we weren't surprised a bit, <laughs> and just think we did MOOCs are just taking it up a level. But I mean, I, MADS is taking as definitely up a level mm -hmm. of intensity from MOOCs. But I, the you know, we, we like Chris and Kevin and mm -hmm. others have Paul. Uh, yeah, Paul, right? That's right. Thank you, right? Mm -hmm. And they so we've uh, we've had a Kristen. lot of MOOC experience, which mm -hmm. prepared us for this very challenging mm -hmm. MADS thing. But I think we're very well prepared to sort of take a big step. I agree completely. So what's really standing out to me, a couple of things, is one, kind of the familiarity that a lot of our faculty bring to what it means to successfully teach in an online environment. And something that we spoke to earlier is that we purposefully created a structure that in some ways mirrors or mimics a, a, tip, a typical MOOC structure yeah. where mm -hmm. we're giving folks um, really rigorous, robust curriculum, but we're doing that in smaller kind of doses, so to say, mm -hmm. right, in our yep. one credit, one month long courses. The other is really kind of how the multidisciplinarity in the School of Information, mm -hmm. which is something that we pride ourselves on, is mimicked in the MADS degree because we have folks that come from economics, that come from computer science, that come from um, Communi communicating data, library science and communication that come from learning analytics and health analytics and, and business backgrounds and kind of all culminate in the degree experience. Right. And maybe you are also teaching uh, the online class as well, right? <laughs> I do. Not in this program, but right. yes, I do. So, so I so know firsthand. So you can see that we have lots of uh, experience. That's exactly right. it. I know firsthand what it means to successfully teach online learners. And mm. certainly I think all three of us would agree that it's not as simple as taking yeah. a residential course, yeah. putting it online, and then, and then saying it's done. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. So Chuck, I have an interesting question for you. So somebody who's already working in, let's say, something like data analytics and using SQL, building models, for example, what kind of value would they get from a degree program like this? Well, they, they might find the SQL class pretty easy. And so then they can work on the other 28 credits uh, that will, will complement them. And so I, I, I think that no matter what your skill is and no matter what you're currently working on, um, you're probably a little narrow. And as your careers progress, do you, the careers tend to narrow us and we get better and we make more money and we get better and we make more money. And it's no different than even researchers. You, you, you progress down a, you're naturally moved into a narrowing thing. And I think that to kind of have your walls busted out a little bit and, and been moved into a professional communications class um, part of it is we don't have a lot of extra classes um, and so pretty much you have to take everything and so yeah you have to take a professional communications class and you might say to yourself why I'm an expert in SQL and I can sit there and communicate with a database all day and the answer is you know in a few years you'll thank us I mean one of the things that that happens in our on-campus uh, uh, curriculum is we have this one class that students uh, complain fiercely about like, why am I taking this class? I, I'm blah, 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 and I'm this, and I'm that, and I don't need to take this class. And then, like, we ask them, like, three years later, what was your most valuable class? And, like, that was a great class. <laughs> like, well, yeah, we kind of had to make you do it. And so I think the breadth of the program, even if you're an expert in one aspect of it, mm -hmm. could be visualization, could be SQL, could be big data, could be who knows what, you probably are missing a lot of things. And in mm -hmm. particular, the past five years, things have changed a lot. I mean, mm -hmm. literally the class that I'm teaching in 511, the technology that I'm choosing wouldn't be the technology that I would choose to teach in five years ago. Mm -hmm. And so it also is a way to update yourself as well. And so mm -hmm. uh, appreciate the breadth of it, even if though you think you're expert and it's great to know something and have a couple of classes be kind of easy because you're already an expert. Mm -hmm. Great. Right. The objective of the curriculum is to build an end-to-end -end pipeline of uh, uh, applied data science. It's really to uh, help you understand how data scientists think about problems, how they make um, you know, decisions, how we go from all the way from uh, you know, the real-world uh, application to delivering you know, the data science uh, product and really to change people's behaviors and decisions. Even I wanted to take some of the courses. I was, I was thinking the same thing. I was yeah. thinking, as you were talking about your course, I was thinking, I want to take that class, but I was also thinking, 
I don't want to take 15 weeks of your class because that sounds too hard. Exactly. But I could take four weeks of your class and I'd be okay. I probably could make it through four <laughs> weeks of your class, but 15 weeks, that'd probably be a little bit hard. And I think, I think students might be feeling the same thing, that with this four-week format, right, mm -hmm. you can mm -hmm. get the things you need mm -hmm. without having to deal with 15 whole weeks exactly. of, like, all the best stuff that you can come up with for 15 weeks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, Jojo, can you tell us a little bit more about how the program incorporates projects? So, mm -hmm. as you can imagine, folks are really interested in knowing, mm -hmm. one, how much or little the program mm -hmm. enables them to work on real problems, right? Real mm -hmm. problems in things like business or healthcare, education mm -hmm. or sports. Mm -hmm. um, but they're also interested in knowing where do those outputs go? So how much or little does a program like this support some portfolio development that mm -hmm. ultimately could be useful in a job search? Absolutely. So um, in this program, uh, we have three projects, three portfolio building projects. The first two of them we call them milestone projects, and the final one is called capstone project. Uh, and the goal is to actually uh, applying what you have learned so far, right? Uh, the milestone one happens after you have finished all these computational courses. Milestone happens after you have taken the uh, analytics and uh, you know, machine learning pipeline courses. And then capstone, of course, summarizes everything to choose the domain that you are uh, the most excited about, uh, find the data that are really useful there, right? And then to actually build something that is unique, that is showing that, oh, I'm really good at this, right? So we encourage students to use real-world data, to use real-world uh, applications, uh, to demonstrate that we can actually make what you have learned, to do something that's completely different. Right. The same idea has been applied to residential, our residential data science programs that uh, we have the, uh, just one project course at the end that is called the mastery class. Uh, I have been teaching that class for three years. So students come in with uh, you know, their proposed uh, project and then the instructor will work with them every week just mimicking uh, what ha what's happening in a real um, you know, data science team in industry. We meet every week, uh, we talk about uh, the, uh, uh, the plan and the milestones and then uh, we finally uh, deliver uh, either the product or the system or the uh, report and different presentation, and then students will actually put uh, that uh, project in their portfolio. And uh, to be honest, many students just got the job <laughs> um, based on that project. So they just tell their um, you know, uh, future uh, employers mm -hmm. about, hey, this is the project that I'm doing right now, right? And if you wait for two weeks or two months, right, this will be done, <laughs> right? And then they got job offers. So one of the things I like to do to motivate project-style classes is imagine as a student that you actually want to do something, right? Mm -hmm. And you have four weeks. Don't the first two kind of work on with each other? The first two kind of are connected, aren't they? The, the milestone one and milestone two. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, but think about this. You one want you. Yeah. To A to B, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So think about it this way, that if you wanted to do something, wouldn't it be nice to have a group of people mm -hmm. who were so smart, just had all these classes, and a faculty member, and teaching assistants, and now you're going to uh, attack this problem, and you can look to either side to get help at any given time. So exactly. you, you could do that by yourself. But now when you're doing this at, after everyone has taken all these classes mm -hmm. and now you've got this time for which you're going to produce a project, mm -hmm. you're surrounded by smart people, right? Mm -hmm. It's a very productive way for you to accomplish something, mm -hmm. to be surrounded by smart faculty, smart teaching assistants, and your fellow smart students who all together just went through this learning experience and now you can really do something great. And so in my on-campus, I don't teach project in MADS, but in my on-campus classes, you know, I, I just find that the students just want to go further and, and the project is a way for them to just keep on going mm -hmm. but then not lose all the support structure that we have yeah. in, on the on-campus class. So we give the same amount of support structure, even more support structure for the project classes. And so, but now that support structure is to advance your agenda, not necessarily follow the curriculum that I've come up with as a teacher. 
That's mm -hmm. great. And Chuck, building on your point, so you're talking a lot about how we have faculty and teaching assistants or um, an instructional team for every maths course. Right. So for those folks that are interested in knowing, then what does that mean for the real help that I'll get? So for example, in a residential program, I would show up at a faculty's office, for example. Can you talk a little bit about the ways in which students get support from our instructional teams while they're in maths courses? Well, there's 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 a lot of different ways. We we staff we have enough staff so we get we understand that part of what we're doing in MADS is asking you to accomplish a certain amount in four weeks, which is kind of different than MOOCs. The MOOCs are a much slower pace. And we understand that you might even just do most of your work on a Saturday and a Sunday. And so we need a way so that you can't lose a week because Saturday at four in the afternoon you're stuck on something. And so so we use things like Slack. You're not, not that we're on Slack 24-7, but we want to get you answers on weekends. We want you to get answers on in the evenings. Um, but, and, so, and we do that and we staff that. But I think the thing that's even more important that in a way is an advantage that we have in MADS over on campus is that not every class, but most cr classes use some form of automatic grading. Mm -hmm which gives more feedback, you get quicker feedback, you get feedback when you make a mistake, and it also means that our teaching assistants are not generally grading the homework. So the teaching assistants don't have to sit there on their dining room table on a Saturday with a stack of papers this tall, flipping through them and spending their five, eight, ten hours just getting your grades. By using technology to do some of the grading, those five, ten hours that they would otherwise spend grading per week are spent helping students. And so whatever time we invest in our teaching staff, myself included, I'm not sitting on my dining room table grading paper assignments either. I am using auto graders. And that's one of the things we can do online that's quite nice, but it means that um, our teaching staff is focused more on the student questions by far and not just one hour of office hours a week or two hours of office hours per week, all week long. And the nice thing about it is as long as the class runs smoothly from a technical perspective, then it's really quite easy for me to drop in every hour and a half and then answer one or two questions every hour and a half. Usually they're, the questions are right on topic. You know, the students have watched the lectures, they've given the old homework a good try, and they're stuck on one little thing, and hour or two later we unstick them and so the, the the nature is it's not like you're spending hours in office hours having the material tutorially taught to you in office hours it's you're you getting the material but you're stuck on one thing and so it's actually I think more enjoyable for the students it's more enjoyable for me and it's more enjoyable for our teaching assistants and the students are getting quicker response than they would if they were here on campus Right? That, you agree? Of course. Absolutely. <laughs> so uh, auto graders, uh, snack channels, are game changers. Game another, changers, right. right. Another uh, important mechanism is the live office hours. Yes. Right. So uh, it's one of the high touch options that we provide to, uh, to the students. So when I am teaching a residential class, right, I also host uh, office hours. There will be students coming to office hours bringing their own, you know, questions, problems. But within one hour, you can probably help, let's say, uh, you know, 10 students at most. Right. And, uh, you know, the answers to them were not going to in, uh, influence other students. Yeah. Right. In the live office hours, so or Slack, in, right, or Slack, right. When when uh, students have questions, uh, they bring the questions to the live office hour, and then we answer those questions. Uh, and then uh, we, if the students can tell us their uh, you know questions beforehand, we can even prepare slides. We can prepare lectures uh, in the live office hours. Mm -hmm. And after that, uh, the the live office hours, the recording will be shared to all the students. And that will actually help many many other students. Right, and uh, you know, because we have an instructional team working on every course, right? Uh, every one of us, the instructor, the, uh, the the teaching assistants, are all hosting office hours, and we cover different aspects, right? For instance, in my data mining class, I cover more about uh, you know the, the uh, course content, mm -hmm. right, and what you need to know beyond <laughs> the, the the videos. Right, and my teaching assistant answers questions about the homework, and also uh, there's another teaching assistant who was my doctoral student, 
who's now the professor at uh, University of Maryland, just after the course, right? So he's talking about how he has been using the data mining techniques that we talk about in his own research. And, and that is delivered to all the students, to 130 students, not to like 10 students who are coming into my office. Well, and, and again, because we use autograders, there is time for that kind of exactly. interaction, yeah. conversation, sort of just serendipitous learning of people talking. And because it's easy to listen to and monitor all those things, uh, lots of folks can benefit from it. I'm, I'm particularly excited as we see our teaching assistants that we use on campus, and they're going into MADS, they're coming back on campus, mm -hmm. going into MADS. I think it's really cool because we have you know a lot of great teaching assistants. I, I wonder when we will start having teaching assistants from MADS that are actually from MADS. Mm. That'd be crazy. It could happen. Right? Because we got some really happen. smart students in MADS. Absolutely. We do. Yes. Well, so much of what you're both saying really is resonating with me. And I think the takeaway here is that MADS students have a lot of access. They have a lot of yeah. access to the faculty Absolutely. that are teaching MADS courses, to the instruction, the larger instructional team, inclu including teaching assistants. And they also have access to the broader UMSI community. So that may include, for example, staff who have specific er expertise in things like career development or alumni mm -hmm. who might live close to where they live um, across the United States and the world, for in, in, in fact. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and answer just a couple of questions again that I think are relatively straightforward. Um, so for example, we have some folks that are really interested in understanding about pace, how mm -hmm. many classes they can take at any one time or whether they can take a break, for example, between um, semesters or months. So yes, that's all possible. So mm -hmm. um, as Zhao Zhu can tell you better than me, when MADS was conceived, it was conceived as a flexible degree option. And what that means is that we wanted students to have some capacity to make choices, for example, about the number of credits that they take per month. And so in the MADS degree, for instance, we have a lot of working professionals who might take one credit in months where they know they have a lot more mm -hmm. work going on in their jobs, and then take two or three credits in months where they don't, for instance. Or we've had a handful of students who've indicated that they want to take uh, a few months off in the summer, for example, so they can get an internship in a data science uh, role and then come back to MADS after having that internship experience. So all of those things are possible in our degree program, which mm -hmm. I think is um, indicative of the way that we talk about it, its flexibility and its, well, its inclusivity for students that are coming from lots of different kinds of backgrounds and mm -hmm. working experiences. Exactly. So how to ensure rigor and flexibility has been the, the largest challenge of building this program. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and so, to some degree what that does mean is you can't really stretch it. I don't think you can stretch it over five years, right? I think that the problem is is that it's not like MOOCs where you can kind of go in and grab a little bit and that's tasty and it was great. These things do build on each other a little bit and these courses mm -hmm. are rigorous and if you take two years off, you might have to go back a little bit. And so it's, we, you know, I wouldn't say that it's completely flexible. I mean, you can, what you said, all those scenarios I think are, we've designed those in, but uh, this works, this works with, uh, with, with not walking away for a really long period of time. Mm -hmm. Right, important distinction right. to be yeah. sure. Of course, another is that if you come back in five years, we we'll be different, we'll, we'll be, be different. different. That's right. right. Hey, yes. I got a question, yes. I have a question. Have, mm -hmm. I've had some students come to campus. Have you had students come to campus? Oh, yeah. How many? Yes. Tell, tell me. Tell, I mean, I've had students come to football games and then come yeah. and visit faculty yeah. on the yeah. way to a football game. Indeed, we have. This yeah. doesn't have to be just virtual. This is true. No, we, yes. we probably made like uh, 20 students already. 20? I would yeah. say at least. I've had like three. Yeah, <laughs> we, we've had many come, who've come to Ann Arbor, for example, for a visit or who live in the Southeast Michigan area. Right. Um, and so in a number of manifestations, right. either at events or in individual meetings, right. for example. And when we go out for conferences, uh, we stop by and say hi, we have coffee, and we, yeah. right, we have lunch. Yeah. So Zhao Zhu, for example, met a group of math students in China. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, mm -hmm. this virtual is efficient, but it's nice to think that it's not, it doesn't only have to be virtual. Exactly. This is a real campus. We have real people. Mm -hmm. We have a real building. Mm -hmm. We have real hallways. We have real offices. We mm -hmm. have office hours and mine are from like one to three on Mondays and you have office hours and I have mad students that say find out when my real office hours are right and 
stop by. Right? That, that's certainly an option. Not anything you would ever have to do. No. But certainly something no. that you could do. And it might be mm -hmm. years from now. You exactly. know, it might be that you end up, you know, graduating with MADS and several years later you finally, but we've had people come mm -hmm. from very far away. That's right. Exactly. That's right. Right. So we've been talking a lot about how MADS encourages cooperation and collaboration between faculty and students mm -hmm. and um, the larger UMSI community. Could you talk a little bit, Joju, about the amount of group work versus individual work in the degree? Uh, yeah, so, um, well, first of all, in project courses, right, we do encourage students to work uh, in groups. Um, well, uh, so uh, typically students will be working in small groups, like two people. Right, and uh, with that, they can, um, you know, both enjoy all the great benefits of collaborating uh, with people, and also uh, they have the largest freedom to deliver, you know, what they have learned yep. to actually make it, uh, you know, uh, their personal uh, project, right? And uh, in the uh, regular courses, right, we see lots of collaborations uh, on the Stack channels. We see students helping each other a lot, Thank right? You. And they are probably uh, more helpful than you know the instructor and the TAs because there will be someone online twenty four seven. <laughs> Right, the the chat, uh, the you know, ask answer questions mm -hmm. from all different time zones. I, I would say one of the things is is that even though we use a lot of project classes in our on campus fifteen week classes, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know what fraction do, but a lot of them do. I, we don't we keep the we keep the group organized group work into the three classes that that spend the whole four weeks right on group work because there's some overhead mm -hmm. to making groups and managing groups and adjusting groups, et cetera, that on, in a 15-week class we can kind of right. handle it. But, but I totally agree with your observation that there's a ton of collaborative learning, right? Mm -hmm. A Absolutely. ton of collaborative learning. Uh, you know, students will just say, I'm having a little trouble with this, and then pop, 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 mm -hmm. and it's like yeah. way faster than me or the teaching assistant can get to it. And I love that. I love, like, that's kind of like a self-organizing learning community Mm -hmm. And what I love to be able to do is go into that Slack message and say, perfect, <laughs> and then move on, right? I mean, right. someone else has already answered the question, and my job is just to say, yeah, that was the right answer, rather than like, oh, man, I'm running late, and I, I missed a couple hours or whatever. But, uh, but the learning is very, very collaborative. I right. agree completely. And beyond the curriculum, uh, there are also like special interest groups that the students create. Absolutely. Right. So if you have an interest in sports analytics or finance, exactly. absolutely. Right. So since we're talking about um, ways in which students kind of traverse the MADS curriculum mm -hmm. and the ways in which we make deliberate decisions about whether or not, for example, we offer a group assignment or an opportunity for peer engagement versus not, can you talk a little bit about the um, amount of courses or kind of conceptually how we think about foundational math and computer science and stats versus true kind of data science topics like machine learning, natural language processing, like kind of what's the blend in the program of those things? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you know, uh, as we said that, we're building the end-to-end -end curriculum mm -hmm. of data science, right? Uh, so every course uh, in our curriculum has the very strong flavor yep. in data science, right? We start with, um, uh, you know, a, a set of computational courses. Uh, for instance, we have um, you know data manipulation. Mm -hmm. We have uh, SQL one and two. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, you know uh, exporter analysis. Mm -hmm. We have two big data courses: uh, efficient data processing and effective data processing. Mm -hmm. And uh, these courses are helping us to build the programming uh, you know background and also to teach students the ability to really play with, handle large-scale, heterogeneous, high-dimensional uh, data sets. Then there's the complete uh, pipeline of uh, analytics and uh, machine learning courses. We have uh, we start with uh, data mining courses to extract features, and we have uh, supervised learning, uh, which is, means that machine learning with uh, labeled examples. Uh, we have unsupervised learning course. We have deep learning course, and then we have a, a you know unique course called machine learning pipelines to talk about how to actually make uh, the pipeline of machine learning um, you know, work. Uh, and then we have uh, specific uh, applications of machine learning in particular um, you know, type of data. Like we have natural language processing course, we have network analytics course, and then we have causal inference, and that's usually missing from uh, you know, a big uh, data science uh, program. Mm -hmm. 
And then uh, we have uh, a set of courses that are trying to help us deliver uh, the, the, the uh, you know, data science results to the audience. We have information visualization, we have uh, communicating data science results, mm -hmm. right? We have even a course called Presenting Uncertainties right? that's being built right now. Uh, and then we have courses that are applying all of these into real scenarios, right? We have application driven courses like social media analytics, learning analytics, uh, search and recommender systems, uh, and we have experiment design analysis. That's great. That's a really thorough overview of the mm. way in which we tackle data science at a more kind of topic level right. and how much of the curriculum is really truly kind of focused in those data science topics where mm. they use good programming and good math, for example, but mm. we're not necessarily focused so much on offering like lots of math courses, for instance. Mm -hmm. So as we think about the courses and we and the, the opportunities for engagement and how students might apply their learning, research obviously also comes up. So can you speak a little bit to how much or little students might have an opportunity to participate in faculty research. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, they have all the opportunities as the residential students have, right? And it's, in fact, it's actually even easier, right? Because, uh, you know, they have more flexibility in the course schedules, mm -hmm. right? If they have time, right, uh, they can, you know, reach out to faculty members involved in their research. There are actually students who have yep. already been doing that, yep. Yep. right? Uh, so when I think of, like, getting involved in research at a master's level. Mm -hmm. Of course, the master's degree is not aimed at getting you involved into research, right? And so mm -hmm. what's cool about research at the master's level is because it's kind of an optional thing. It's not like you have to feel bad if you're not doing it. Um, you can, I, I always tell students to think of the classes that they're taking as like ways to make new friends with faculty members, <laughs> right? And so you, you take a class from somebody and you kind of figure out the measure of their work and we all sort of expose our work in the classes that we teach. We don't, we always take the lens of our research interests and we, we don't hide that. Um, and, and, and like you say, you now have kind of, you've met somebody, you've got to know them mm -hmm. and the research is usually something happens after you've met somebody and you say, you know, you kept talking about sports analytics during this class and I'm interested in sports analytics. Tell and me I more ask them a question in Slack and then all of a sudden, right. and then, and then it goes. And so um, I think that's one of the joys of taking a master's degree and just playing with research, right? It's not, it's not like you're a PhD student and if no. you're not doing research, you're really unhappy, <laughs> right? And he's like, you got your time, your clock is running. And so you can look at your master's time. Um, this, this, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not recommending people, but if you were on the slower path, you get more exposure and more mm -hmm. time to fit things in, right? I know when I did my own master's degree, which was a residential master's, I did five years. And it, I was frustrated that it took so long, but I got to do a lot of different things mm -hmm. in the gaps in between my classes. Um, mm -hmm. And so, I, and, and I'll, I'm curious what you say, but my, my recommendation is um, the best way to get a faculty member to want to work with you from a research perspective is uh, not to tell them so much what you're interested in and say, um, you know, I'm interested in XYZ, why don't you help me do this, right? What, what's important is for you to figure out what that faculty member's interests are and then walk in in a way to help us. The, the example I give is, um, let's say you'd, you'd never played basketball in your whole life and you'd really like to learn how to play basketball and so you come and go into the University of Michigan basketball's coach's office and say, why don't you teach me basketball? Well that's not going to work very well, right? Because our basketball coach has people that for, you know, 18 years of life did nothing but basketball and they watch. And so you got to figure out what's going to be good for them and how it is that you make that initial contact with faculty is you should understand their research, right? You should not be like, here's my great idea. You should help me make my great idea work. I mean, I, I'm curious, <laughs> if you would agree with that uh, Yo, advice? Yeah. Well, yes and no, actually, okay. right? Um, I, I think for us of us, it's definitely that, right? So uh, a student comes into our office and saying that, uh, hey, I'm really interested in your research, right? Here's the paper, your paper that I have read. Yeah. Right? That makes us excited. And the, even better that, hey, here's something that I think, you know, uh, if, if we, uh, you know, did this instead of that, would that, could that have been better? That would definitely intrigue our interest. 
But there's another type of interest that the students come in and bring uh, their you know, very unique problem, saying that, oh, here's the, actually the problem that if we could solve the problem, that uh, we can actually make you know, a million people uh, live better lives. But I don't know how to solve that. Mm -hmm. uh, do, you know, do you think this is a real problem? And do you know how to solve it? And so the, pro the way that yeah. works for me is often in project classes, uh -huh. where the students pick a project. Right. And I'm just kind of like the, 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 you know, the greater mentor guide of that project. And sure. I'm all of a sudden like, wait mm -hmm. a second. That's kind of interesting what right. you're doing. And so now, so at least they're doing something that I can look at and say, you've made some good progress on that. Let's, mm -hmm. let's see what we can do with what you started with. And I've actually mm -hmm. had that happen to me in my on-campus classes. I'm like, holy mackerel, that's a really cool project. Let's keep talking. Right. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So we're at the hour, but we're having such great conversation that we're going to go ahead and continue for a few minutes. So for those of you that have to to end your participation in the webinar because you have additional commitments throughout the day. Um, that, you know, thank you for joining us. This recording will be available, and so if you want to catch the end of it in an instance where you have to depart now, we welcome you to do that. For those of you that can stay, we're going to go ahead and take just a few more minutes and answer a few more questions. So I have a few demographic questions that I'm, I will happily uh, answer uh, because it's related to the kind of data that I track in my role of thinking about and acting on who is a participating MAD student. So for example, we have one question about what does the typical MAD student look like? And the good answer is that there's really no typical MAD student. So if you were to look across, for example, years of professional experience, we have about 20 to 25 percent of folks who have very little professional experience, so about zero to two years. And then conversely, we have about 20 percent of 20, 25 percent of MAD students who have 16 or more years of professional experience. And so what this is enabling us to do is to have some really great conversation and some informal mentorship for those folks that have been working yeah. professionals for a long time mm -hmm. and those folks that are relatively new to being working professionals. Relatedly, we have some folks that are asking us about the typical size of Matt's cohorts. So oh. I can tell you that right now we have about 185 mm -hmm. um, active MADS students. We would anticipate that our next cohort and future cohorts would look about ar around that number, um, you know, somewhere around the 200, you know, 250 um, number of students who are kind of coming in and joining us. So it's a great number of students to work with. We have lots of activity, as both Chuck and Zhao Zhu have pointed out. Um, and that's something that we certainly want to build on, which is to continue to invite um, good, strong cohorts of students. Mm -hmm. Not, not you know, something unmanageable, mm -hmm. um, but conversely, not something that also feels like it's perhaps too small to really meet our objectives of building the strong Is that community. 200 twice a year or 200 once a year? Uh, it depends on the year, Chuck. So, <laughs> <laughs> so for now, we had, two, we had a, a fall start and a winter start. Mm -hmm. We're going to, to, our application for our fall 2020 start is actually open as of now, so we strongly encourage folks to start their applications. So we'll start another cohort in fall 2020, and then we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. uh, we see a future where we're likely rec re recruiting multiple cohorts a year, mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. we're just not quite there yet. So for now, mm -hmm. we're, we're focusing on our fall 2020 starts. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Great question. And then finally, we're getting a lot of scholarship questions. So I'm going to just address this in a somewhat superficial way. Um, so I will tell you, yes, we do offer scholarships. And that's somewhat unique for an online degree program. And in this last round, we actually offered, I can't give you the exact percentage, but I can tell you that we gave out a lot of scholarships to incoming MADS students. Mm -hmm. So in an instance where you're applying to the MADS program, the good news is that you automatically are considered for scholarship consideration. And what that means is that when we review your application for admission, we also review your application for scholarship. Mm -hmm. So we do offer scholarships. We can't disclose at this point what our scholarship model will look like for this next year, um, but I can certainly tell you that that is something that we do, and we're always happy to have a conversation with someone around the cost of the degree or how they might fund the degree or the ways in which they can pay a tuition bill. Mm -hmm. So the other piece of good news is that the University of Michigan has a structure in place where we have a couple of different payment options that people can pursue. We also have a lot of folks that are pursuing employer reimbursement yeah. or a participation in education through employer programs. Amy, one thing I think you should amplify is that there are humans involved in this process and it's not like you're going to call an 800 number and then hit your touch tones mm -hmm. 
It's like press one, press that's right. four, that's exactly press right. 12, <laughs> that's press, exactly right. wait a second, I don't even have a 12 on my phone. That's exactly right. right. Meaning that people should ask, people should not, they, the, 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 it's humans involved in this, right? The, absolutely. The humans that care. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Right. So, so you're, you're never more than a Slack message or an email away from a, from a real human. That's exactly, exactly it. it. it yeah. yeah, absolutely. And then finally, we have folks that are really just interested in understanding what kind of access we give to University of Michigan resources. So the three of us uh, have probably not surprisingly been in conversations um, together in mm -hmm. groups where we talk a lot about how do we ensure that MAD students get access to the resources that they want and need. So the good news is that MAD students do have access to, to most of the, the same ac services that University of Michigan residential students have. Mm -hmm. So things like the library and um, buildings on campus and uh, recreation um, opportunities. So all of those things are no different for MAD students than they are for residential students. They get ID cards? They do. They get you get the little clicky things in them? They get, you get M cards where you can use them for student discounts. None of that changes. And you don't actually physically have to come here for an M card. So in really? An, yeah, you don't have to. I did to. not know that. Yeah, so in an instance <laughs> where you're living uh, in a place that's not geographically convenient to Ann Arbor, Michigan, we can happily work with you and the M card office to ensure that you get an M card, yeah. Are we the first people that did that? I Let's say we are. I don't think I can verify the veracity of that claim, but we're going to make it. So. I love bending the rules. Right. I love us changing That's the rules. That's exactly it. So can you talk a little bit about the job outcomes and kind of the way in which you're seeing the professional landscape for data, uh, for data science folks changing and evolving? That's a good question. That's a good question. Ah. I'll start and let you think of the real answer, so I'll make up. Uh, so, so I, I, I don't have the data, Amy, that you have, right? Um, I would say that a large fraction of our MAD students already have a career. And they're, some of them are exceedingly successful already. Mm -hmm. And so, to, you know, you're, you're talking to our master students like, hey, did you get your internship? How's it going to go? Are you going to miss class because you're doing interviews? I, that doesn't feel like it. And the ones that I've talked to at length and personally, they're sort of thinking this of this as like, I'm going to grow. I'm gonna, I'm going to I'm 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 doing great. Mm -hmm. I I could just keep doing this forever, but I want to do a growth thing. Absolutely. Um, and so I, I think what we're going to find is that it's not about getting the job the way it is so much for on campus cohorts. It's about where this lets them go. And I, I think that it's going to some degree be undefined, right? I think that mm -hmm. they. They're, I would say that the ones I've talked to are satisfied in their job, successful in their job, uh, think that there could be more, and are going to let MADS kind of show them the path to more, rather mm -hmm. than on campus it's like, I don't have a job, I'm going to get a master's degree, I'm going to do an internship, mm -hmm. I'm going to get a job, and then I'm going to be good and pay off my student loans or whatever, right? So it's just, it, it's more of a like, the, it's, it's an opening of something that they're already in a good place. And I, that maybe I haven't talked to enough students, um, mm -hmm. you know, that are, that I haven't yet met a student who's thinking of this as, I'm going from not job to job, mm -hmm. the way a lot of our master students are uh, on campus think. Exactly. Yeah, so uh, we have been heard lots of discussion about, you know, uh, data scientists are the sexiest job in the 21st century. They start, that's a great job. Right. Yeah. the big, uh, you know, you yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's a big lack of uh, data scientists uh, but the question is, where are those jobs, right? Uh, my, uh, I have been working with lots of companies, lots of uh, you know partners, lots of my uh, old friends in uh, this domain. We realize that uh, the biggest lack of these jobs are not in Silicon Valley. <laughs> they are everywhere. They are in you know uh, you know more traditional businesses, every you know disciplines, every you know uh, sectors, right? Uh, and they have the biggest difficulty of finding the right people. And why? Because they not only need people who have data science skills, they need people who have both have data science skills and understand the business, right? So the question is, how can you actually train people into uh, these people, right? And the answer is, right, you, if you know business already, then come here and uh, you know, get your data science skills. Right, and that's usually more efficient than if you know, if you have the tools, if you have the hammer, and you're going to look for the news. 
right? So uh, in our uh, experience with residential students, uh, you know, we, we have worked with, uh, you know, residential data science students. Uh, most of them found jobs uh, in, you know, places that when you heard about that, you, you, you first think that, wow. And then you say, oh, that's reasonable. <laughs> Right. For instance, we have a student uh, who graduated from our uh, MSI program. Um, you know, he spent a few years at the university in the development office, uh, and then he went to California. Uh, he's now the associate dean of uh, uh, development in the University of uh, South Can uh, California. He wrote a book, which is uh, Data Science for Fundraising. <laughs> <laughs> and who would have guessed? How right. smart. Who, who right. would have guessed? Right. Exactly. And we have students who uh, just just done the uh, uh, capstone project from the program, and then got hired at Mayo Hospital, right? and now managing you know the data science team there, right? So these are the places that there are lots lots of jobs available, right? In hospitals, in uh, you know transportation companies, in Ford, in General Motors, right? In Nike, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. uh, in sports teams, right? Uh, in universities, right? And you know, in, in many other, like in Home Depot, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, so they can find people who know both the data science skills and the business, right? This has been something that's been from as long as you and I have been here. This is the the nature of the School of Information. Exactly. We produce graduates right. that are hyper valuable in lots of places that you might not expect, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and and so it's there. It's sometimes, it's not that there's some line that you just get in the back of the line and when right. you get to the front of the line, you get hired. Right. It's, it's, everybody is a bit more of an individual. And I think we spend time trying to train people in our curriculum how to communicate their own skills because they're not just getting in a line to get a job, right? They, mm -hmm. They've got to be able to have a portfolio. Mm -hmm. They've got to be able to communicate what they were. I mean, I remember when we graduated our first bachelor students, you know, we spent a lot of time explaining to them how to explain <laughs> to their job what it was they were good at. And, and they all got jobs and they were all great jobs and they were all many ways surprising and like right. holy mackerel. And, and, and part of it is, is that there are lots of places in this world, especially data mining places, that they're not sure exactly what they're doing and if you brought in like 10 PhDs in computer science and dropped them in the middle of this organization, the place would explode the next day because there's just too much like intense brain power there. Whereas if you have an organization that's thinking about data mining and they need to bring some talent in, one of our graduates has softer edges and will we'll figure out what needs to happen in this organization and how the organization needs to change mm -hmm. and not just say I got nine skills and we're going to use all of them this week and you're going to change to meet me our students are trained to figure out their environment right and then and then have a whole bunch of skills they might not be super expert in any of those skills but they have so many skills that whatever it is that organization needs then they can grow that skill in that organization. And so we, I, I, I find a lot of our students over the past decade tend to change the organizations that they become part of in very good ways. Exactly, that's what okay. they're extremely good at. Yeah, so we've really talked, I think, about what makes the School of Information, University of Michigan School of Information graduates unique, mm -hmm. how they make value adding contributions to not only the jobs that they go into, but how those professions evolve over time and that they're equipped to manage those evolutions. And that a degree like the MADS degree is applicable for folks that are launching data science degrees as much as it's applicable for folks that are now in data science roles mm -hmm. and want to really bolster those skill sets or folks that are working in industries where they see data science problems that they want to solve. Mm -hmm. I also Absolutely. think there are people who evolved into data science from some career and they don't feel they have the credential to move into leadership in data science, right? And so a lot of data scientists are self-made over the past 15 years as the fields evolved and people may not have the confidence nor the credential mm -hmm. to kind of move into a, say, a leadership role or mm -hmm. have a broader, just, it helps people say, I'm going to grow a bit, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. uh, to have a credential. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank the you. best data science practice always happens within the context 
Right. Right. And yeah. if you know the data science techniques and you know the context, you are going to be the leader. Great, great points. Mm -hmm. So we did get a couple of admissions-based questions, and given that we're coming to the close of our time together, I will offer for folks to go ahead and email us at umsi.mads at umich.edu in an instance where you have a specific admissions question on things, for example, like what Python or statistics MOOCs should I participate in mm -hmm. in order to be prepared for the degree? Um, or What's the TOEFL requirement in order to be a competitive MADS applicant? So we're happy to answer those admissions questions. I will also tell you that our website is a wealth of resources on what to expect in the application process. And there we've also outlined exactly what our admissions criteria are, including information on things like, again, TOEFL, our entrance assessments, ways in which to prepare for Python and statistics. So as we wrap up, I want to give both Jaju and Chuck just a quick opportunity to say any last kind of burning things um, about MADS and the School of Information. Um, I'll go first, and I'm going to actually riff a little bit on your admission thing, and you feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. I will. <laughs> um, one thing that, that has been, I think, a joy to me and something I'm very proud of at the School of Information is our admissions process, not just for MADS, but for our undergrad, for our community college transfer, for our masters. Um, and that is that I like to tell people we don't care so much about the numbers, right? We don't take a big spreadsheet and sort it by GPA or GRE or whatever. And I understand that, that it's easy to do that if you're a highly desirable school to just take and, um, and sort the spreadsheet by numbers and just have a thing and throw away the bottom 80% and then just kind of play around with the top 20%. Because we believe as a core value that that's not the top 20%. <laughs> the top 20% can't be characterized by numbers, by entrance scores, by interest admiss admissions. And, 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 and the way I think of it as our admission process leans toward trying to produce a cohort of people that you'd like to hang out with, right? A cohort, a good group of people. This is a, a group of people that's diverse, it's different. We bring different perspectives. We're not trying to find all of the calculus geeks and then just have nothing but calculus geeks here. Um, and so I encourage people to share who you are in the admissions process and not try to meet some imaginary perfect template. And there are so many places in this world where the admissions process is a template process and you make one mistake and you're kicked out. Um, again, I'm not involved in it so, and I'm really glad that I'm not involved in it because I know it's a ton of work to think of each person as an individual and admit them as an individual. How, how'd I do, Amy? You did pretty well, Chuck, because okay. we do use a holistic <laughs> review process, <laughs> and we are looking at the whole person and everything that that person brings, mm -hmm. um, and their, you know, and why they want to be here when we make admissions decisions. I, I think it is our value, our core value, to not be so big or so awesome mm -hmm. that we turn it into numbers, right? We're we're all people, right? Everybody is a person. And the students are people too, and so that's that's my wrap up. Is that I, in, especially in this situation where where the geographic distance is getting bigger, I don't want that friendship, intimacy, and human aspect to go. And I think we're working very hard to not let the human aspect of our our what it really means to have a good education includes people, and it's not just facts, figures, and quizzes, but it's people. I agree completely. Chaju? Well, uh, yeah, uh, I echo is what <laughs> ever Chuck said. So I just want to end with that. Uh, this is a Michigan degree, right? So we're trying very hard that we, are, uh, we, we have to meet all the Michigan standard, and we have to be the leaders uh, of the world. We have to uh, keep innovating. Uh, otherwise, we're not you know, uh, Michigan. We're fortunate to have, uh, you know, star instructors like Chuck. We have uh, the administration, um, you know, uh, juniors like uh, uh, Amy. We have the, um, our uh, administration team that's very visionary uh, and who spent lots of support uh, on this. Um, and we are even more uh, lucky to have you. And we wanted to work with you and to build this program, the best data science program in the world. 
So well put. Thank you so much to both of you. So it was such a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Um, Python guru, Dr. Chuck, program director, Zhao Junmi, and I can't think of two better panelists to start us out on this next MADS application process and journey. Um, so for those of you that are here, just a quick reminder, this is not our last webinar. So for those of you that want to join us again in instances where we're focusing on admissions more specifically or career and professional development more specifically, I would welcome you to come back, um, ask more questions, meet more folks in the University of Michigan School of Information. But otherwise, thanks again for joining us. And as always, go blue. Go blue. Cheers. <laughs>